there are two balloons, and it gives us some information here. So one, two, and three actually goes along with this. Number four is separate. Um, and so the first part of today, we're going to actually go through and review partial pressures and the ideal gas law, um, what happens when you change pressure or volume in terms of different variables. So it says each balloon shown above has the same volume. So these are both at the exact same volume. The gases are at a pressure of 1 atm and a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius. So these have the same volume, the same pressure, and the same temperature. The balloon on the left contains 2.016 grams of H2. The balloon on the right contains oxygen. So, number one, how many molecules of H2 are present in the left balloon? So this just wants us to go from grams of hydrogen to molecules of hydrogen. So this is a stoic problem to go from grams to molecules of the same substance. So I'll do it up here. 2.016 grams of H2 wants me to go all the way to molecules. Well, up on the box that's on top of the bookshelf, we have Avogadro's number, just in case you forgot. Avogadro's number is also on your equation sheet. It's on the front on your equation sheet if you also need it. But before we can use Avogadro's number, you need to get to moles. Remember, moles is always what we have to go to in between. So I'm gonna go from grams of H2 moles of H2. One mole of H2 is 1.08 times 2, 2.016. So there's one mole of hydrogen gas inside the blue. Well, we don't want to end with moles. I want to multiply by Avogadro's number. I almost did it in my calculator. 2.016 divided by 2.016 is 1. Times 2.022 times 10 to the 23rd is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of H2. All right, there's number one. So again, for number one, all we did is we took the grams of H2 that we were given in the problem and went to molecules. Number two, how many grams of O2 are in the right balloon? So let's go back and review what the problem has given us. They're at the same volume. They're at the same pressure. They're at the same temperature. Well, if P, V, and T are all the same, N should also be the same. If pressure, volume, and temperature are all the same, moles will be the same as well. Moles will be the same, not grams, moles. So if we have one mole of oxygen gas, how many grams is that? 32. 16 is one oxygen times two. So this is using the idea that when pressure, volume, temperature are the same, moles are the same. Thinking about all of those different variables. Number three, what is the volume of each balloon in liters? So let's look at the conditions that we're at. One ATM and zero degrees Celsius. Zero degrees Celsius is 273 Kelvin. One ATM and 273 Kelvin is STP. Well, once that beach ball spins around. Standard temperature and pressure means that we can use molar volume. It means one mole of a gas occupies 22.4 liters. We have one mole of gas. We have one mole of gas. That means we have 22.4 liters. Now, if this were two moles, then we just multiply by molar volume. Right? One mole of a gas occupies 22.4 liters. But we can use molar volume here because we are at 
STP. If we were at any other set of conditions, we'd have to use the ideal gas law. All right, then number four. So this is not related to these balloons at all. A mixture containing 0.765 moles of helium, 0.33 moles of neon, and 0.11 moles of argon is confined in a 10 liter vessel at 25 degrees Celsius. Calculate the partial pressure of each gas and the total pressure. Well, remember, with, par with partial pressures, we act like each one of these gases are behaving individually. So we have helium behaving individually, neon behaving individually, argon behaving individually. We can calculate the partial pressure of each one of those and then add them all together to find the total pressure. So if I have moles, I'm going to ignore neon and argon for now. I have moles of helium. I have volume of the container. I have temperature. Well, think. I'm solving for pressure. I have volume, number of moles, and temperature. I can use the ideal gas law. Use PV equals NRT. So if I use PV equals NRT, I'm solving for the pressure. Again, right now, I'm assuming helium is by itself. I'm ignoring neon and argon. So pressure is N times R times T, all divided by V. So if I'm solving for the pressure of helium, I need this N to be moles of helium. Always check your units. I was grading the unit two tests, and the one thing that I found that people missed the most had to do with units. Double checking and making sure that your units always match up. So N is moles, you're already given moles. R is the ideal gas law constant. Now if you're solving for a pressure, typically uh, the APE exam will want you to use 0.08206 because that lets you solve an ATM. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. And then volume is in liters. So if I'm solving, and I'm kind of moving up the board a little bit. Helium, 0.765 moles. R, 0.08206. T has to be in Kelvin. Add 273. Remember that that's on your equation sheet. K equals C plus 273 is on your equation sheet. So that's 298 divided by the volume, which is 10 liters. So if I plug this in to solve for the partial pressure of helium, 765.0826.298. So for the pressure of helium, I got 1.87 ATM. So we want the partial pressure of each one. So we found helium. I'm going to have you guys do neon and argon. The only thing that changes is the moles. R is a constant, R never changes. Temperature is the same and volume is the same because they're all in the same container. So take just a minute, plug in and solve for the pressure of neon and the pressure of argon. I will as well. And we'll make sure that we're all getting the same things before we try to find total pressure. So I just plugged everything right into my calculator because, again, the only thing that's changing is your number of moles. So for the pressure of helium, I got 1.87 ATM. For the partial pressure of neon, I got 0 0.807 ATM. So I just rounded to three significant figures. And for argon, I got 0.269 ATM. Now here's a, another way that you can kind of double check and make sure that your math is what it should be. And this is what I actually just did. So 
I notice that neon is 0.33, argon is 0.11. Neon has three times the number of moles as argon. Neon should also have three times the pressure as argon. Because the only thing is, that's changing is moles. Moles of pressure are directly proportional. And that is 0.269 times 3 is 0.807. So here are all of the partial pressures. How do we find the total pressure? We have the three individual. Add them all up. So 1.87 plus 0.807 plus 0.269. And again, your sig figs could potentially be a little different depending on if you like if you left it in the calculator or not. So if I do this to three, oh well no, if I add them, I do the least number of decimal places. Oh yeah, that's still two. 2.95 ATM is what I got for total pressure. So this is using the idea of the ideal gas law and Dalton's law of partial pressures. Now, is there a different way that we could have solved this? Yes. If you did it differently and got the same thing, that's okay. Um, but this is probably the way that I see most people solving it. You remember that individual gases or each, each gas behaves individually when it's in a mixture of gases. Um, any questions on the do now? All right, so if not, um, just kind of looking at this week. So like every Monday, I just have this, you know, lesson plan screenshot in. Um, remember that I will see you guys on Friday this week. So your guys' test is actually Friday. So instead of Wednesday, like originally it was going to be, you guys get it to take the test on the second day. Um, so today we're gonna be reviewing videos uh, 3.4 and 3.5. We're gonna be doing a lot of different examples. Um, I'm gonna go back based on some of the questions and hit on some of the stuff from 3.5, which is the real versus ideal gases. Tomorrow is essentially just a work day. So we're gonna do a quick review of the stuff that we covered today, um, just to make sure any final questions can get answered. And then it's basically just working on mastering. Um, and then Wednesday, we'll be doing some free response questions, and then there'll be time to work on the review. And then Thursday, the green group will take the test. Friday, um, you guys and everybody that's online will take the test. So just finishing up gases this week. One quick change. Originally, mastering was due Thursday. It's now due Friday, since you guys are at school on Friday. So um, that is, I went in and already changed it, but mastering will be due Friday. Obviously, having it done before you come into class would be useful for the test, but you do have until 2.30. Um, and then there is no weekly review since we have a test this week. Um, and I will be pushing out like the feedback to the weekly review probably during fifth period when I'm in study hall. So just kind of be on the lookout for that. Okay, so like I said before the do now, um, I'm gonna be going through, these are actually the questions from the ideal gas law uh, video. It were the, was the questions at the end of the ideal gas law video that a lot of people uh, were asking about. So if it's easier for you to just have this up like on your computer screen, on your Chromebook screen. Everything that I'm clicking through, these are all the do now slides. So if it's easier for you to have this open on your Chromebook, you can. Um, you can always go back and refer to these. I have this recorded. So if you need to go back, especially with anything that we talk about today, I'll edit the recording during study hall, get it posted up. I'll change it in the lesson plans um, to reflect the recording from today. But I do want to go through these. So a lot of the questions that were at the end of the ideal gas law video, so it's video 3.3. These were some of the like pressure, volume, temperature, relationship questions. But then it also tied in partial pressures. These were all practice multiple choice questions that College Board has released. So these are all kind of some practice questions. 
So for this, it says that the figure below represents two sealed containers, each with the same volume. So they both have the same volume. Pressure of argon is two atmospheres. Contents of both containers are then transferred to a one liter container at the same temperature. So temperature is remaining the same. We don't have to worry about temperature. It wants to know what the total pressure in the new container would be. So when we have particle diagram questions like this, and you will for sure see particle diagram questions, they're starting to ask more and more of these types of questions. I notice that I have volume and pressure of this box, but only volume of this box. So I first want to look at what the pressure of the xenon would be. So if I focus on what we're given, so it's the same volume, same temperature, but notice that the number of particles or the number of moles is not the same. So since the number of moles or number of particles is not the same, pressure will not be the same. Pressure is proportional to the number of moles in the container. That's Avogadro's law. So here, two atmospheres represents six particles in the container. Well, if the xenon only has three particles in the container, what do you think we would expect the pressure to be? One. So the pressure of the xenon in the original container is one atmosphere. Again, because pressure is proportional to the number of particles in the container. So now let's look, let's assume that I mix these two, I, I put the argon into the xenon container. The volume is the same, I just add the two together. If I mix all of the argon into the same container as xenon, the pressure would be two atmospheres plus one atmosphere. So if I added these together in the two liter container, the new pressure would be three atmospheres. But if I go from a volume of two liters down to a volume of one liter. So I have volume of two liters with a pressure of three atmospheres. And I shrink it down to half of its size. First, if I have a larger volume of two liters and I decrease it down to one liter, what would I expect to happen to the pressure? Should it go up or down? Should go up. Okay, so the pressure should go up. I can cross out A and B. So the pressure should go up. These two numbers are less than three atmospheres. Well, technically, if it should go up, I can cross this one out as well. The answer to this question is six atmospheres, and here's why. I have three atmospheres in a two liter container. I shrink the volume to half of its size. I should be doubling the pressure because it's inversely proportional. Now, could you set it up with a combined gas law? Yeah, you could. P1, V1 over T1, P2, V2 over T2. Temperature is constant. Well, if the pressure inside this two liter box is three atmospheres, volume is two liters, what's the pressure gonna be when I shrink it down to one liter? solve it that way. But you could look at it conceptually. So this is actually looking at two different things in one. It's looking at partial pressures and it's looking at changing the size of the container. So that was the first multiple choice question. The second and third one looked at two samples of carbon dioxide. So this said that the sample represents two sealed containers, both at the same temperature. Okay, so temperature is the same, which means they're at the same average kinetic energy. The container on the left has only carbon dioxide. The one on the right is contaminated with water. Both samples behave ideally. Pressure in sample two is most likely what? So they gave us some information. One liter, one ATM, 25 degrees Celsius, one liter, 25 degrees Celsius. Remember that pressure 
is based on the number of particles. It does not matter what kinds of particles there are. It is just dependent on the number of particles. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten particles in sample one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are ten particles in sample two. Same number of particles means the same number of collisions, which means the same pressure. So if the pressure was one atmosphere in sample one, it's going to be one atmosphere in sample two. And again, it's because pressure is just based on the number of collisions. If you have the same number, same number of particles, you have the same number of collisions. Then the next question asked about density. You just need to remember that density is the mass per volume. You don't have to do any math with this. On the AP test multiple choice section, you actually don't get a calculator. Unless they change that this year, you don't get a calculator. So for density, you just need to remember it's mass per volume. Okay, well, these are the same volume. They're both one liter. So look at the mass that's inside the container. I have 10 CO2 molecules. They have a molar mass of 44 grams per mole. Here, I actually have eight CO2s and two waters. Water only has a molar mass of 18 grams per mole. So I have more mass in sample one, less mass in sample two. Greater density is the one that has the greater mass per volume, which would be what sample? When you say sample one. Right, sample one is going to have the greater density because it has more mass in one liter. So it's not, you don't have to solve, you don't have to use the ideal gas law to solve. You can just think about density being mass per volume. And then there was this last question um, with the movable piston. So volume of the gas is initially at five liters um, and then it's compressed to a new volume of three liters, new pressure of P2. Temperatures held constant. What effect does this change have on the average kinetic energy of the particles? Average kinetic energy is measured by what variable? What measures average kinetic energy? Temperature. temperature. The only thing that measures average kinetic energy is temperature. If temperature is held constant, what's going to happen to average kinetic energy? It stays the same. You will always, always see at least one question like this on the test. There were at least two or three of them on the weekly review that asked about different variables uh, and then asked about average kinetic energy. Average kinetic energy is based on temperature. Unless temperature changes, average kinetic energy stays the same. All right, so now we'll get back into um, 3.4 and 3.5. I just wanted to go through those questions since they are sample multiple choice questions that looked at average kinetic energy, pressure, um, so 3.4 and 3.5, this probably is the new part of gases. The first part, um, and there were some questions on the maxwell boltzmann distribution. I want to look at how we can examine the speed of gases graphically. So they've started asking more questions using the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, and you had some of these drawn in your notes. The Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shows the distribution of speeds of a gas at a certain temperature. So this is actually an old multiple choice question. You can see because I have the answer circled. I just took a screenshot from an old, um, an old quiz. So, what you're given with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is you're given the number of molecules and you're given the speed. So this says that the graph above shows the speed distribution at a certain temperature. 
Then it will ask what a graph would look like if you change the temperature. So then it says which of the following graphs shows the speed distribution of the same molecule. So you're not changing the number of molecules, but you're going to a lower temperature. So what we have to think about is if it's the same number of molecules, the area under the curve here represents the number of molecules. If you're not changing the number of molecules, the area under the curve will not change. Now, you could squish the curve or you could elongate the curve. We first need to think about, okay, if we're lowering the temperature, if we're lowering the temperature, what is that going to do to the speed of the molecules? Are they going to speed up or slow down if I'm lowering the temperature? They're going to slow down. So if they slow down, I would not expect to have my graph moving this way at all. The x-axis is speed. So if they slow down, my average speed needs to move to the left on the x-axis. Now here's what we need to keep in mind. We are not changing the number of molecules. So if I need the speed, the average speed, to get lower, I'm just going to squish this graph. Because when I squish the graph, I'm not changing the number of molecules, I'm not changing the area under the curve, I'm just changing the average speed. So when I squish the graph, that's why I actually circled answer choice D. The area under the curve is still the same. I know the graph looks different, but the area under the curve still has to be the same. So when there's an equal number of molecules, area under the curve is the same, but the distribution will shift. The temperature is lower, molecules are moving more slowly, and so the peak of the curve is shifted to the left. Now, if we wanted one that was at a higher temperature, then we would just, we still have some that are actually moving at zero meters per second. Right. This is showing the average. Some move faster, some move slower. If I want it to be a higher temperature, I'm just going to grab the end of this curve, and I'm just going to elongate it because I have more gas molecules that are traveling at a higher speed. So if I wanted one that was at a higher temperature, A would actually show at a higher temperature. So the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is just showing how the distribution of speeds for certain gas look at different temperatures. So now we're going to kind of go conceptual math, conceptual math, just so that way we can kind of keep our brains working. When we're calculating root mean squared speed, so there are really two additional equations that we haven't talked about yet that you're going to want to know. That's root mean squared speed and um, Graham's law of infusion. We'll look at Graham's law in a second. So root mean squared speed. There are different types of speeds that you could calculate. Most probable, root mean squared, average. We focus on calculating root mean squared speed. So this is the speed that a gas molecule possesses um, that has a kinetic energy the exact same as the average kinetic energy. So root mean squared speed is the speed of a molecule that has the same kinetic energy to the average kinetic energy. When we calculate root mean squared speed, the equation for root mean squared speed, so remember that speed and velocity for our sake is the same. So when we talk about speed, we're talking about velocity. So we're going to have VRMS. So velocity or speed, RMS for root mean squared. Root mean squared, the name, just comes from the equation and how we write the equation. So root mean squared speed is the square root of 3 times R times T over the molar mass. So the equation for root mean squared speed 
You want to star this equation. Just make note of it somewhere. You do need to know this equation. Before you start plugging numbers in, I just want to make sure that you're plugging in the correct variables. When we plug in R, because we're dealing with energy, velocity comes from kinetic energy. Since we're dealing with energy, we're going to use the energy R. And that's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Temperature still has to be in Kelvin. Molar mass actually needs to be in kilograms per mole. The reason that molar mass needs to be converted to kilograms per mole is because a joule, joule is our unit of energy. A joule is actually a kilogram times meter squared per second squared. So in order for our units to cancel appropriately, right, my moles will already cancel, but I need to make sure that my molar mass is in kilograms so that it cancels with the kilograms portion of the joule. So this question just wants us to calculate the root mean squared speed of the molecules in a sample of N2 gas at 25 degrees Celsius. So root mean squared speed is the square root of 3 times 8.314 Temperature needs to be in Kelvin. So instead of 25 degrees Celsius, it's 298 Kelvin. And then we divide by the molar mass. So if I'm just looking at the periodic table, nitrogen is 14.01 grams per mole, but there it's N2, so I'm going to multiply by 2. So it's 28.02 grams per mole. Now I don't want grams per mole, I want kilograms per mole. Remember that there are 1,000 grams in one kilogram. Again, the reason that we have to convert to kilograms is because I need the kilograms portion of the joule to cancel. And I can show you the cancellation of the units after we solve. I just didn't want to get everything too overwhelming within the square root. 0 0.02802 kilograms per mole. You can probably tell from this the most missed thing is actually making sure your molar mass is in kilograms. So as we plug this in, we're going to do 3 times 8.314 times 298 divided by 0 0.02802. You get a big number, 265,264. That's still within the square root. We do the square root last. So I take the square root of my answer. BRMS is 515. Velocity, speed, meters per second. So the way that our units work in here, I'll show you what our units look like without the numbers. Three is just a number. So it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. A joule is kilogram times meter squared per second squared. Then on the bottom, we'll also have mole Kelvin times Kelvin over kilograms per mole. I'm just showing you how the units cancel. So we have per mole on the top, per mole on the bottom. We have per Kelvin times Kelvin. And we have kilograms over kilograms. So when I take the square root of meters squared per second squared, it's meters per second. So that's why we have to make sure all of our units 
are in joules per mole Kelvin and kilograms per mole in Kelvin. All right, root mean squared speed is the only speed that you'll have to calculate because we're assuming that in this case, these N2 molecules have the same kinetic energy as the average kinetic energy. Any questions on root mean squared speed? Right? So then we're going to look at effusion versus diffusion. And for those at home, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to see diffusion. I'll turn my computer so that way hopefully you can see as much as possible. So there is a difference between these two terms. Diffusion is the spread of a gas. So it's the spread of a gas in a container. Effusion, effusion is the escape of a gas through a pinhole. So for diffusion, we'll look at diffusion first. Um, we're going to actually look, and I have this YouTube video that we'll look at in a second. But for diffusion, I'm going to use, you know, just neutralize the smell in here. All right, so high spray Lysol. Now, it all depends on where I stand and how the fan is blowing on the particular day. But if I stand here, I don't want to get it in anyone's eyes. So if I stand and I spray the Lysol, you guys are not going to all smell it at the same time. If I stand and I spray the Lysol right now, once you smell it, raise your hand. All right? So, oh, no. It's clean cotton. Wait. Driftwood waters. It's like the clean cotton smell. Oh, uh, it's going to be a little hard. Yeah, you might have to, like, you know. Oh, yeah. Okay, so notice, <coughs> I smell it. Right, so notice how, oh man, okay, I have to move around a little. It wasn't everyone at first raised their hand. This kind of simulates how gases move. Slowly the gas will move throughout a container. Now, diffusion is based on the speed of a gas, which is based on the molar mass. So the lighter the gas, the faster it's going to move. The heavier the gas, the slower it's going to move. So I usually say think about, like, in football, you have, you know, running backs are usually smaller than, like, linemen. Usually the running backs can run faster. They have a lighter mass. Now, it's not always the case, but usually. So... I want to look at this example, and I don't think there's sound. So with this, we're going to look at diffusion, we're going to look at how gases travel. I will tell you that this is always a test question. So we have NH3 plus HCl, and it forms a solid. So in this glass tube, right, we're going to dip the cotton ball into HCl. We're going to dip a cotton ball into ammonia, and then they'll become gases. So liquid will become gas. And what they're going to do is they're going to travel in this tube and eventually form a solid. Now I want to pause it really quick so we can look at this. When we have these two gases traveling in this tube, gases move based on the molar mass. So the lighter the gas, the faster it travels. So look at the molar mass of HCl and NH3. Right, so it's what, about 36.5 and about 17. Clearly different molar masses. So we would expect NH3 to move a little bit more quickly. Most people usually look at this and they say, oh, the solid's gonna form right in the middle. But that's assuming that HCl and NH3 move at the same speed, but they don't. So when we actually perform this, we notice that the solid actually forms closer. Oh, yet. 
right? So the solid actually forms closer to the HCl because NH3 moves faster. So since NH3 as a gas moves faster, HCl moves more slowly, they're gonna actually meet closer to the HCl to form the solid. That's the idea of diffusion. So the idea that gas molecules move based on the speed. So they're gonna move based on the speed. Then for effusion, so think about a balloon over time. We have a balloon that's filled with argon and it's filled, filled with helium. Argon actually sinks down because it's more dense than air. So if you've actually seen a balloon that's filled with like, um, is it sulfur hexafluoride? It falls right down onto the, onto the floor. Helium is more dense. That's why they, they look different. Over time, helium will actually shrink faster than argon. Effusion is based on the speed of the gases as well. It's not based on the size. It's not because helium is smaller in size. It's because helium is lighter and so it moves faster. So we're not comparing the size of the helium molecule like in terms of like diameter. We're not saying, well, helium can fit through the holes more easily. No, it's that helium actually moves faster. And since helium moves faster, it's more likely to escape through the microscopic holes that exist in balloons. Okay, so that's the difference between diffusion and effusion. So Graham's law. Um, I don't think I had this problem in the notes. Oh, I did. This is example nine. I added this. So this is example nine that's on page eight. So example nine on page eight. So this is Graham's law of effusion. So this is the second equation that we're gonna look at today. So remember that effusion and diffusion are related to the rate at which gases move. Graham's law, Graham's law of effusion states that the rate of gas one over the rate of gas two. So the ratio of two gases is inversely proportional to their molar masses. So it's actually inversely proportional to the square root of their molar masses. So what we look at with Graham's Law is that we are looking at the molar mass related to their speed. So for this problem, it says an unknown gas composed of diatomic molecules. All right, so if it's composed of diatomic molecules, that only gives us a few options. Ron H. Cliff, or however you remember. Those are your diatomic molecules. It effuses at a rate that is 0.355 times the rate at which oxygen diffuses at the same temperature. Calculate the molar mass and identify it. So as I look at this equation, this tells me that the unknown effuses at a rate that is 0.355 times the rate of O2. So I'm going to assume that rate one is the unknown, rate two is the oxygen gas, only because that's gonna make the math a little bit easier. So the unknown effuses 0.355 times oxygen. So if oxygen's rate is one, the unknown's rate is 0.355 times that, so it's 0.355. So that means that the unknown is rate one, oxygen is rate two, and that's important because we have to make sure that our molar masses match accordingly. So I'm gonna have the square root. So oxygen is gas two, so that means it's gonna be on the top. You do not have to convert this because just remember the, the units need to be the same. What's the molar mass of O2 gas? 32. And I'm solving for 
for the unknown. Now, be careful with this math. I am solving for a variable within the square root. So when I say be careful with this math, first thing I need to do is get rid of the square root. How will I get rid of the square root on this side? Square both sides. 0.355 over 1 is 0.355. So 0.355 squared. 0.126, I'm going to just keep it out to all of the, the numbers of the calculator. Be very careful. Uh, I was working with some people on mastering last week, and they were rounding to one significant figure during their work, and their values within mastering were changing drastically from what they were supposed to be. So don't round until the very end. So we get 0 0.126025 equals 32 over x. Be careful solving this. x is on the bottom. x is the denominator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by x. I need to make sure that x is a numerator. So I have x times 0 0.126025 equals 32. I'm going to do 32 divided by... 0.126025. And so X, which is the molar mass of the unknown gas, is 253.9 grams per mole. So there's the molar mass. Then it says identify it. Well, remember that this gas is diatomic. So we only have so many options. It has to be one of the diatomic molecules. We know it's not hydrogen. Look at the periodic table. So if it's diatomic, this is the mass times two. So if you look at the periodic table, look and see of Brown H. Cliff, what diatomic gas must this be? Well, it's actually the heaviest one. You actually look, iodine is 126.9. 126.9 times 2 is almost the same as this molar mass. So the identity of this unknown gas is I2. So Graham's Law of Effusion lets us relate the rates at which gases effuse to their molar masses. Remember, effusion and diffusion are related um, to the, the speed and the molar mass of the gas. Speed is only based on the molar mass. Average kinetic energy is based on the temperature. All right, so see if we get, well, the bell's gonna ring. So I'm gonna put this up on the board. I'll let you guys read through this. Um, when the bell rings to come back, we will do this one, and then we're going to talk about real versus ideal, and then you guys will have some time to practice. So read through this. This is actually just a sample AP question. All right, so like I said, this is actually a practice AP style question. You can tell because it says, do you agree or disagree and why? They're asking many more of those questions than they ever used to. So it says a student sets up an experiment. Uh, compares the deflation rate of two gases. So that means they're looking at the effusion. Uh, they choose helium and argon, inflate it to the same pressure volume temperature. Student notices the helium balloon deflates significantly faster and says that helium is a smaller gas and can more easily fit into the molecular sized holes of the rubber balloon. Do you agree or disagree with the student's claim? Base your answer on principles of kinetic molecular theory and properties of gases. Kinetic molecular theory means they want you to talk about the motion of the gases and the speed of the gases. So at first, when I read this question, I was like, well, yeah, helium is smaller, so it's going to effuse more quickly. And then I realized that the way that they said this, it can more easily fit into the holes of the balloon. So in this problem, they're talking 
that helium is simply smaller in terms of diameter and can fit into the holes of the balloon to escape. We are always assuming that the size of the particles themselves are not going to have as much of an effect if they're behaving ideally. Yes, helium is a smaller gas, but a smaller gas means that it moves more quickly, collides more, and is more likely to escape. So the answer to this question is actually disagree. So we actually disagree because the mass of helium is less than argon, the particles will move at a higher speed. That increases the chance of them diffusing out of the balloon. So it's about the speed of the gas, not the actual size of the particle. We always are talking about the speed that they're effusing. So here's another just multiple choice question. Consider three gases all at the same temperature. So all at the same temperature means same average kinetic energy. Kinetic energy and speed are different. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Kinetic energy takes into account the mass and velocity. Speed is just velocity. And the lighter the particles, the lighter the gas molecules, the faster they move. So this wants you to list them in order of increasing average speed. So that means slowest to fastest. So remember the fastest gas molecules are the ones that have the lowest molar mass. So if you look between these three, HCl, H2, and O2, let's look at which one would be the slowest. Between HCl, H2, and O2, which one would be the slowest? HCl, All right? So we can ignore A and D. Speed is just based on molar mass. So we're between B and C. HCl is the slowest. Which one will be the fastest? H2. So B is our answer for this one. The higher the molar mass, the slower the gas's speed. The, uh, the wait a second. The higher the molar mass, the lower the speed. The lower the molar mass, the faster the speed. This is off topic. Like, if you have an answer like A, is it like never that? Usually. Yeah, usually. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're usually going to always have an answer. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to spend just a minute to talk about real versus ideal gases. There were a lot of questions that were like, can you just talk about this again? So first and foremost, you will not be required to use or do calculations with the Van der Waals equation. You are given the Van der Waals equation. You do not have to use it. You don't have to do anything with it. The very last slide of this will show you exactly what you have to memorize in terms of conditions. But on the test two years ago, they did ask some more questions about what we would expect to be true of pressure. So from the kinetic molecular theory, remember the KMT describes ideal gases. They say collisions are elastic. There's no forces uh, between the particles, and the particle volume is negligible. That means that we can ignore the volume of the gas molecule itself. However, real gases don't actually follow the kinetic molecular theory. All gases are able to condense into a liquid. If we get it cold enough, they will condense. So that means that there are some attractive forces between gas molecules. And molecules vary in size. They do have volume. So we have to look at what conditions are gases more likely to be real or are they more likely to be ideal. Now, in this video, um, we did talk about some intermolecular forces, and we haven't gotten completely into intermolecular forces yet. That's actually the first part of Unit 4. So I'm not going to ask questions that require you to remember 
hydrogen bonding or dispersion forces. Um, instead, we're going to just focus on what happens as attraction increases. You don't have to be able to identify them yet. So we're going to look at the real gas behavior and its effects based on intermolecular forces, based on attraction. When there's significant attraction between gas molecules, the number of collisions will actually decrease and the pressure is less than what we would expect. And I have the particle diagrams at the bottom of these slides so that you can see. It shows real versus ideal. So in a, in an other way, ideal and real, there we go. So in an ideal scenario, we have temperature, volume, we're at STP, 22.4 liters. We assume the gas molecules are behaving ideally. However, as attraction increases, well, now we have gas molecules attracted to each other. So now instead of just bouncing off of each other, they're attracted to each other and they're moving in pairs or they're moving in trios. So now, as we've increased the number of attractions, we've decreased the number of collisions. So once there's attraction, the gases are not colliding as often as they were if it was ideal. So as attraction increases, the actual pressure is going to be less than what would be predicted with the ideal gas law. At high temperatures, so when we have extremely high temperatures, the gas molecules move so quickly that when they actually hit each other, they're able to bounce off. And so at high temperatures, gas molecules are able to bounce off of each other and we can assume that there's no attraction. High temperatures are when gases behave ideally. So the higher the temperature, the more likely the gas is to be an ideal gas. At low temperatures, so if the particles are moving much more slowly, then when they come into contact with another gas molecule, they're gonna be more likely to be attracted. So at low temperatures, these attractions become significant and the gas is non-ideal. These two bullet points are going to be the most important. High temperature is ideal gas. Low temperature is a real gas. So again, high temperature, ideal gas, low temperature, real gas. And that's due to the attraction. If they are going to collide and they have a chance of being attracted, that's more likely to be a real gas. And again, if you need to go back at any point to view these slides, they are part of the do now slides. Then we look at volume and volume is a little bit harder to kind of wrap your brain around. I was going back and like rereading so that I remembered. Um, so when you have particle volume, so when your gas molecules actually have a substantial volume, the number of collisions actually increase. So here's why. Let's assume instead of a gas molecule being this big, it's this big. So now, instead of a gas molecule being smaller and having to travel a lot more to collide, it's bigger. So now it's more likely to collide with other gas molecules and with the wall of the container. So when your particles actually have volume and they take up more space, so in this particle diagram it shows, again, ideal gas versus real gas. As the particle volume increases, we have more collisions. So the actual pressure is going to be a little bit more than what's expected. When the particles have volume, they don't have as far to travel for a collision to occur. So that means that as the volume of the particles increase, pressure will be a little bit more than what we expect because if particles have more volume, there's going to be a few more collisions. Again, these two bottom bullet points are going to be what's most important from this slide. At low pressures, the space between the molecules is much greater than the volume of the molecules themselves and the gas behaves ideally. So low pressure 
ideal gas. Here's why. This is what I had to think about as I was looking at, at pressure, because pressure I always have to sit and think about for a second. Low pressure is when the volume of the container is big, right? A large volume results in a small pressure. So a large volume, you now have more space between all of the gas molecules in the container. So at a low pressure, we will have more of an ideal gas because the space between the molecules allows us to ignore the volume of the gas molecules themselves. At high pressure, so if I shrink the box down, that increases pressure. As I shrink the size of the container, these gas particles, the volume of these gas particles is going to become much more significant. So at high pressures, particle volume becomes significant and the gas is non-ideal or real. Non-ideal and real gases are one in the same. So again, for pressure, low pressure, ideal gas. High pressure, real gas. So that looks at temperature and pressure. So again, when our gas is non-ideal, this is what you want to memorize. Whether you memorize non-ideal slash real or ideal conditions, just memorize one set of conditions. So gases are non-ideal or real at low temperatures and high pressures. Gases behave like real gases at low temperatures and high pressures. So if you memorize this, then just remember if it's opposite, it's ideal. This is because particles have significant intermolecular forces. So the gas particles are attracted to each other. And particles have a significant molecular size or significant volume. And that's at high pressures. So gases are non-ideal or real at low temperatures, high pressures, and that's due to attraction between the molecules and volume of the molecules. So this is what you need to know about real versus ideal. The last few slides are useful as well, because like I said, we've seen questions that say, why is pressure greater or less than what was expected? And that's due to the real gases. So here's an example. Under which conditions do you expect helium gas to deviate most from ideal behavior? So deviate most from ideal behavior means it's going to be a real gas. So deviate from ideal means that it's a real gas or a non-ideal gas. So this is where if you just memorize when you have real gases, that will help you answer. So you have real gases at what kind of temperature? Low temperatures. We have a real gas at low temperatures and high pressure. That's when gases behave most like real gases. So then you just look and see which one of these matches this. Low temp, high pressure. Which one of those matches? Hopefully, you say B. We expect helium to deviate most from ideal behavior at low temperatures and high pressure. So this is B. Okay. 